Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, this week's TPI seminar. So we're very pleased today to have with us uh, Professor Sorab Maiti from Concordia University in Montreal. So uh, Sorab obtained his PhD in 2013 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, so working with Andrei Chubukov. And then he uh, was a Dirac postdoctoral fellow at the National High Magnetic Field Lab in Tallahassee uh, between 2013 and 2015 and subsequently held uh, two more postdoctoral appointments at the University of Florida and also University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, before joining the uh, physics department at Concordia as an assistant professor in 2019. So he just started his group there. Uh, and so he's a kind of matter theorist who works broadly on strongly correlated electrons, uh, high temperature superconductivity and uh, systems with a strong spinner recoupling. And so today he will be telling us about his uh, recent work on the interplay between spin orbit coupling and interactions in a solid state systems. So uh, thanks very much, Sarab, and uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, uh, thank you all for uh, being here and giving me an opportunity to share um, sort of some of the things we have been uh, doing recently um, on spin orbit coupled uh, systems. And today I'll uh, primarily uh, tell you about uh, certain zero field uh, spin resonances that we uh, find in these systems and uh, what, what are the properties of these resonances, what they can be uh, used for. And before I go on, I just wish to um, acknowledge the people uh, that I've collaborated with. Um, most of this work uh, has been with uh, Dmitry Masla from University of Florida, uh, with some help from other postdocs and students over there. And for some of the uh, experimental collaboration uh, to support the work that we have been doing, we approached uh, Gish Bloomberg in Rutgers who does Raman scattering experiments. And I'll talk about some of these experiments as well as we uh, go on. Um, Abhishek also um, is involved in more of the recent work with Graphene. He was actually in UF and recently moved to uh, Rutgers. So, um, the outline for um, today's session is uh, along these lines. Um, I'll, I'll introduce uh, really what I mean by spin orbit coupling here uh, and why I, why I say what I mean by it will be clear uh, in a moment. I just want to be um, separated from the usual notion of uh, what that would mean. Um, and then we'll revisit the case of uh, the two-dimensional electron gas and ask what are the spin resonances there and what do we understand about that? And we'll extend that understanding to uh, our case with um, 2D electron gas with spin orbit coupling. And uh, we'll see what are the new spin resonances that are uh, in, in, induced over here. We call them the chiral spin waves. We'll, we'll see why they're called so. The effect of glass. And uh, so in our case, uh, the system is more complicated because we have uh, two media basically. Alex, um, so yeah, turn up here. Uh, oh yeah, that's better. And uh, we'll we'll look at uh, uh, basically what their properties are, why uh, why they appear in zero field, how many of such resonances there are, what is the physical interpretation of that, and also of course the damping of these resonances um, are they uh, well-defined and uh, can they live on for long. And finally, we'll look at uh, some of the observables and uh, some experimental support for the work we have done. And we'll conclude with looking at other 2D systems where similar things can be expected. And I'll briefly uh, just state the results that we see um, on uh, graphene grown on tran trans transition metal dichalcogenide uh, layer. So, uh, before I jump into sort of the, the physics part of it, I just want to uh, place a perspective on kind of where, um, what, what field this research is supposed to target. Now, there's a catchphrase which floats around, which is like beyond electronics. And really the idea is the conventional paradigm of a transistor where you have charges in the source and you move the charges to the drain uh, under the influence of the gate. Um, uh, this thing it has fundamental limitations and it arises from the fact that when you move charges um, you can't do them fast enough because there'll be losses and there's joule heating and other things. To circumvent this, um, already two to three uh, decades ago uh, the idea about uh, a spin transistor was proposed by the Tandas and of course the idea is we do the exact same operation except the information is now transferred not by physical motion of charge 
the electronic layer stays intact, but we do that with spins. You inject spin, you sort of propagate spin from one to the other as a spin wave and detect it at the other end, et cetera, et cetera. And it has the promise of extremely low power consumption and much faster speeds, except there are many challenges in this field in, in and of itself, but that's set aside. And this field uh, basically got uh, the name of spintronics. And this is not the only one. There's also, uh, so this idea uh, was actually recently implemented uh, on silicon chips. Um, so a 2D layer on a, a silicon substrate, doped silicon substrate was, uh, uh, spin was injected onto that layer and was transferred and detected at the other end. So this, um, this is basically the state of the art where, where it is now. Uh, this is not the only field, of course, there's uh, also magnonics where um, it has to do more with propagating spin waves. Uh, so just like we uh, have buses and circuits to kind of propagate signals from one part to the other, here you can do that with a spin channel where you can excite the spin, propagate in a given direction, amplify and do these other things as well. Um, and also, more recently, uh, there's uh, Valleytronics where uh, you kind of do the electronic version of zero and ones, but you do it with systems which have um, uh, different minima and energy so that you can selectively populate one value over the other, and that can uh, basically mimic the, a zero state or a one state, and you play around with uh, exploring this additional quantum degree of freedom that uh, arises. So instead of spin, we, ex we uh, take care of the valley uh, flavor here and uh, look at what happens. And there are systematic reviews and progress reports on this. Uh, this is probably already outdated, even though it's 2019, 18, and something like that. Um, it's um, every day more and more people kind of work on it. But from a physics point of view, the, really the interesting part here, uh, which is sort of common to uh, development in all of this, is, is something called spin orbit coupling. And um, one asked at this stage, well, why is spin orbit coupling so important in all of this? So let me just um, show uh, just very quickly um, uh, what aspect of spin orbit coupling is actually leading to uh, this result. So the origin of spin orbit coupling is uh, the same for everything. Uh, it's a relativistic effect and it's really um, sort of an effective magnetic field that is created due to motion of electrons in an ex external field. And this effective field couples to its spin and hence the motion and the spin of the electron is coupled and spin orbit coupling, that's where the name comes from. However, in condensed matter, this same, this effect manifests itself in um, well, at least two different ways. One is what we can call it as something that preserves parity. Parity here is just spatial inversion. You might as well just call it inversion for that matter. And this is the scenario in essentially um, all semiconductors. So for example, this is the band structure of an SP semiconductor. The S bands form the conduction band. The yellow and green are the spin up and spin down. They're degenerate. And we have the whole three whole bands. Each of them spin degenerate again. Okay, so the Kramer's degeneracy and inversion symmetry sort of guarantees that you maintain spin degeneracy in this kind of a band structure, even though there is spin orbit splitting between holes and any, anything else. However, uh, the one that is actually relevant for, let's say, spintronics and all of these other things is the one that breaks parity, um, or in simple language, inversion. And uh, one can check that even though you don't break time reversal, but breaking of inversion is enough to sort of lift the spin degeneracy in what uh, we had seen in the semiconductors otherwise. And so the, the blue, sorry, the, the green and the, uh, the, the yellow bands which represent the different spins are already split. And uh, the most common type here is the uh, Rashba-like term, which is momentum crossed with the spin uh, of the system. Um, uh, the, there are also something like a Dresselhaus term. This is actually a three-dimensional effect. But uh, if we do talk of two-dimensional systems, you can always project that 3D effect onto a surface and get to a form like this. The form of this Dresselhaus part of the Hamiltonian is actually not universal because it depends on the crystalline uh, axis um, that you choose to measure things from. But the Rashba term is uh, sort of a C infinity V. It's uh, rotationally invariant in plane and will look like this no matter what. Okay. So all the effects that I will talk about today has to do with this type of spin orbit coupling that, uh, uh, that, that breaks parity or lifts this uh, spin degeneracy in, in the system. 
And uh, really what makes this special um, is um, its ability to uh, control the spins by electrical means. And what I mean by this is, let's imagine a 2D layer and we shine light on the system. So it's a little photon coming in with its electric and magnetic uh, fields present. Uh, whether that photon will be absorbed or not, or how much of it will be, um, is actually captured in this equation uh, where sort of the, uh, the conductivity part couples to the uh, electric field part of the electromagnetic um, field. And the, um, the spin response of the system is captured in the spin susceptibility and that couples to the magnetic part of the uh, incident electromagnetic field. And it so happens in uh, spin orbit coupled systems that this, uh, the, the, the conductivity tensor can be expressed in terms of the spin susceptibility tensor with the proportionality being these um, spin orbit coupling parameters that we saw in the previous slides. Alpha is usually the Rashba term, beta here is the Dresselhaus term. Um, and uh, what this allows us to do is write uh, sigma in terms of uh, the spin susceptibility. And then we see that any spin signature which would have been contained in uh, the spin susceptibility tensor can now be felt through the electric field as well. Okay, so you can uh, control um, the spin modes that you have, uh, not only via coupling to the magnetic field, but uh, via electric field. And it turns out in the particular systems we are looking at, the numbers play out such that the coupling to the electric field is actually much stronger than uh, that of the magnetic field. Technologically, this is extremely desirable, which is why people um, are so uh, interested in spin orbit coupled systems. Um, and that is simply because uh, you want to move to um, operating with spins because uh, you, know, you minimize losses, but then uh, controlling spins with magnetic field, including uh, incorporating magnetic field on chip is a challenge. So doing something like this where you still control everything electrically uh, but you control the spins is basically uh, getting all the goodies in, in one basket, so to say. So um, we may ask at this stage, okay, uh, that's about uh, why it is exciting. What is it that really allows us to express this conductivity in terms of the uh, spin susceptibility? And the answer is actually fairly straightforward. So if you look at the full Hamiltonian, uh, that's, this is the usual free electron part, for instance. Uh, the Rashba part is added on here. And when we couple the electromagnetic field uh, to this Hamiltonian, it takes this particular form. And then we, when we try to get the current operator, we instantly see that there's a, uh, the usual, let's say the free carrier part, which contributes to the Drude response that comes from this thing. And there's an additional, um, let's say term introduced uh, to the current vertex and which comes from the, which comes from the spin orbit coupled term. A similar term also appear, appears for the Dresselhaus uh, one as well. And um, it is uh, essentially this component um, of the current vertex that when you look at the current current correlation to look for conductivity gives you square of spin orbit times spin spin correlation, which is spin susceptibility. Okay? And of course, this has been known um, since I don't know, probably the 60s or 70s. Rashba himself. Um, uh, Emmanuel Rashba himself uh, discussed this, and uh, this is uh, what we call as the electron dipole spin resonance. Now, I do want to emphasize that this, uh, the electron dipole spin resonance, uh, the statement about this is the, the fact that whatever resonances we might observe in the spin sector of the two-dimensional uh, electron gas is now um, viewable or can be measured or can be probed using a charge probe. That's really the statement. And the coupling is provided by the spin orbit coupled uh, system. So uh, at this stage, there is nothing about new spin resonances in the system. It's more about, well, the usual spin resonances that you would have, which you would not have seen in, the, in a charge probe, you can now because of this EDSR coupling present in the system. So um, at this stage, we may ask, okay, well, what do we know about spin resonances uh, in the usual uh, uh, two-dimensional electron gas? And it's actually worthwhile spending um, a couple of minutes to just remind ourselves what we know about these systems. Um, the first resonance, in fact, this is the only resonance in, in, in TUDEG, and it's uh, usually associated with the fact that, well, if you apply a Zeeman field, um, so we can imagine an in-plane field to this 2D system so that we don't have to deal with the Landau quantization effects. 
And that's going to split the spin up and spin down energy levels. And you can have a resonant transition between the spin up and spin down levels. And this splitting is what I call delta Z tilde. And the tilde is there to denote the fact that this splitting is renormalized by electron electron interaction. Okay. And that is captured in the renormalization of this G factor that is present over here. However, um, what measurements show is that you actually find the resonance not at this renormalized energy, but at the, uh, what one would term as the bare unrenormalized Zeeman energy, so to speak, or in other language, and it, it detects this unrenormalized G factor in the system. And this has been seen already uh, more than a couple of decades ago in helium and in metals like sodium and potassium, uh, et cetera. So, you may ask, well, uh, what is actually going on? Well, I mean, the resonances between these states, which are split, so uh, what goes on? Um, and the answer, there are many ways to interpret this. If you ask the ESR community, they have a different interpretation, but I would like to give uh, the interpretation which makes most sense to me, and that is in terms of electron-electron interaction. So this resonance is really, uh, is to be seen as um, sort of this uh, uniform part of the collective mode um, in the system. And what I mean is, imagine you're shining a light with certain frequency and wave number onto the system. You excite the system with this energy and wave vector. And if you look in that phase space of omega and Q, um, the possible spin excitations you can have from the system uh, is in this, this shaded blue region. So um, at Q equal to zero, it's a single dot. That's because it's a uniform shift. In, uh, in the band structure because of the Zeeman energy. And as we go to finite Q, that really broadens. And this is the continuum of spin excitations that you would have. And when you account for electron-electron interactions, I'm just gonna put, label that by U, that's some dimensionless electron-electron interaction times density of states uh, quantity. You will um, undoubtedly get a renormalized um, uh, scale at which the continuum begins. But when we try to, uh, probe spin-spin correlation functions, there is an additional effect that comes in due to electron-electron interactions. And it's the fact that it actually forms a bound state uh, in this momentum space, so to speak, where the bound state is really, it singles out as one particular state at every Q from this continuum of uh, states. And that is really the collective mode. It's, uh, again, was discussed in the 60s. It's the, the Cillin mode. Um, sometimes also called the Cillian Leggett mode because the same was studied in helium and Leggett, Tony Leggett did a lot of work on that uh, as well, but the same idea essentially. And uh, the splitting, how much it splits off from the continuum is sort of dictated by the electron-electron interaction uh, strength in the system. Okay, and uh, the, the resonance that we think of, the, what ESR people would see is this Probing at Q equal to zero it is this particular mode at uh, delta Z. The continuum has basically no weight uh, at Q equal to zero. So this is the only spin resonance in the two-dimensional electron gas. And um, we may ask at this stage, well, okay, uh, do we have a physical interpretation of what this mode is? Uh, it's not like this is a magnet where we have processing uh, magnetic moments about, uh, um, about a, a equilibrium orientation of spins. Well, yes, we do, and um, it, is actually, it actually parallels that of uh, insulating magnet, where we have these free electrons which are moving around and their spins are randomly oriented, which average out to zero. But when you apply a, a field, um, the, uh, uh, the spins, no matter how they are oriented, start processing about that field. And just by themselves, uh, the precession can, uh, the phase, coherence between relative precisions are all randomized, so they still average out to zero. You don't get anything. It's actually the presence of electron-electron interaction that uh, builds up coherence across the entire sample and sort of coherently makes magnetization process in a plane that is perpendicular to, um, to the applied field. And it processes at this frequency, g mu bb, which we all, it's Zeeman energy or the Larmor frequency. Uh, they go under different names, but essentially the same thing. Um, so, uh, this is a physical interpretation of, um, um, well, the resonance that you would see in, 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 in the two deg. It's uh, simply this precession of magnetization uh, in a plane perpendicular to B. And we then ask, well, okay, how does any of this change when we, um, when we introduce spin-orbit coupling? Um, 
Of course, as I said with the EDSR slide, that spin resonance is, is going to show up in conductivity, but that's a trivial effect. What I want to emphasize is on other things that sort of come about. And besides, that trivial effect happens in the presence of a field, so it's really not a zero field spin resonance that I promised to show you. Okay, so uh, the system that we look at is modeled in the following way. So this is basically just the two dig Hamiltonian, which almost everybody uses. The Dresselhaus term depends on the choice of axis, but in what we'll discuss, it is um, it's basically taken in this form. Um, so uh, we have. Uh, a term from Rashpa, which have a term from Dresselhaus. Um, and just for information, this is a, a property that uh, just shows up on the surface as soon as you have inversion symmetry breaking. To get Dresselhaus, you need inversion symmetry breaking in the crystalline structure itself to get this component to be present. You can't induce it just by um, having inhomogeneity across, not inhomogeneity, but uh, going from below the surface to above the surface, um, mismatch, having a mismatch over there. And uh, we apply an in-plane field with, uh, and that couples to uh, uh, the spin sector as well. And we know what this does to the electronic structure. Um, I mean, the Rashba term sort of uh, uh, develops this Mexican hat type um, modification to the spectrum. The magnetic field simply uh, shifts the parabolas up and down. But as far as um, itinerant properties are concerned, um, the Fermi surfaces look basically identical in these two systems. They are concentric circles. Really what is different is in one case, the spins are polarized. In the other case, the spins are not a good quantum number anymore, but they are sort of chiral. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the spin projection at every K point, um, they are just um, uh, equal and opposite, pretty much like how you would find in the magnetic field. With Dresselhaus, it's a different spin orientation. Um, and you can also play around by um, relatively tuning the strength of the magnetic field relative to spin orbit coupling. And you can move the Fermi surfaces around. And you can close the excitation gap between the two uh, Fermi pockets. And this will become relevant shortly uh, in a moment. So these are the things you can do just from um, um, the band structure uh, po point of view uh, of these systems. Um, but here already, um, I think uh, um, sort of the uh, punchline of the talk is captured, which is the fact that, well, okay, uh, we were talking about zero field spin resonance. It seems like it's obvious here. Like if we turn the field off, uh, so we don't have this particular effect here, uh, the Rashba term already splits the spin degree of freedom. So it should be no surprise that you have some sort of a resonance between these uh, spin split states. And in fact, that is really all that happens. There is no other surprise to it. What is exciting is understanding what the what their properties are, and I'll and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. So, to study these resonances, um, what we do is fairly standard, so I won't spend much time on it. But if you have questions, I'm happy to entertain uh, that. Um, you can do it either by quantum Boltzmann equation, um, where you look at this uh, delta n, the change in the density, um, and track how it evolves. And if you capture a term like this in, in the calculation, that tells you you get a propagating wave in your system at a certain energy and wave vector. And uh, this coefficient gamma tells you the damping. Or if you like doing field theory, you can just um, do it using Kubo formula and Feynman diagrams and calculate correlation functions and you look for poles of this form. And they basically match up one to one if you're doing equilibrium physics at least. And there is one more technique um, which uh, people interested should definitely take a look at this. It's fairly ingenious, which is uh, you can map the whole pro the problem of finding collective modes or resonances for that matter to a problem of solving a one dimensional Schrodinger equation uh, on a lattice. And the collective modes turn out to be the bound states of that system at, at certain defect points. And so that's all I'll say about that particular approach. But one can choose whatever approach they like and just proceed with what we want. And what we did was the usual diagrammatics. I'm gonna skip over this. It's fairly, it's, um, it can get involved, but it's fairly standard and straightforward. Um, under certain simplifying assumptions like projecting onto the S-wave channel for the interaction so you can um, carry out these calculations manually, you can get a cl nice closed form for your susceptibilities and conductivities in general. So that's really the point of the slide. You don't need to know anything else. So let's look at what, um, what doing all of this actually tells us. Um, so um, 
the, the Cillian mode spectrum in this omega and Q space looked like this. We had the continuum of spin flip excitations and we had this uh, single uh, isolated collective mode below um, split from the continuum. Okay. And um, so what I'm going to show here is actually the Q equal to zero part of such uh, phase space. And uh, I'm going to show what happens when we sort of scan the electric field from, well, sorry, the magnetic field from zero to some uh, finite field number here. So it is really just this axis with a third B field imagined along um, the other direction. Um, for the simple case of two deg without spin orbit coupling, uh, it is this bland feature, which is um, omega is equal to g mu v b. So it is proportional, linearly proportional to b, and that's the only thing that we get. When we include spin orbit coupling, this is the final result. Uh, you get a continuum of incoherent excitations, and then you get uh, up to three collective modes that are introduced in your system. And there is this critical field at which the uh, continuum sort of collapses to zero energy. That in fact is the point where the Fermi surfaces touch, which I showed a few slides back. Um, that's the special point. And uh, as expected, if you tune the field to a um, energy to a scale which is large compared to the to an energy scale that corresponds to spin orbit coupling, you recover the fact that these modes converge with the the Cillin mode, which was the dashed line and all of that. Okay. And uh, really, this is the part which um, I advertised in the title of the talk that uh, these are, uh, you get spin resonances even in zero field, which was not the case uh, like before. And this is important to sort of just uh, take in because thus far the examples of spin excitations were either it's excitations around an externally applied magnetic field in the system or it's excitations of um, of a magnet, uh, of a ferromagnet, which has magnons as uh, the spin waves propagating. In this particular case, it's uh, the system um, does not, the, the ground state of the system does not break uh, time reversal symmetry, but you do get spin excitations in the system um, as a result of uh, spin orbit coupling. Okay. And um, so, we okay. We recognize that this is uh, these are what the uh, spin excitations look like, and we call them the chiral spin modes. Um, the term chiral spin is simply because it's coming from the uh, transition between the chiral spin states of the um, of, of, of the system. Okay, so we may ask at this stage. Okay, well, you know, um, how is the story really different? I mean, we did split the spin degree of freedom um, when we applied an external field and it was due to the transition between spin split states. Now, okay, we don't have spin split states, but it's uh, effectively some quantum degree of freedom, which is chiral uh, in that sense. And there's transition between that, which does flip the expectation value of spin between these states. So are they any uh, different? And this is, really, this is really going to be the subject of uh, the rest of the discussion that will follow. And uh, the point is there are actually several interesting features if we ask the right questions. And they kind of um, um, are along these lines. Well, the Cillin mode was just a single mode. Why is it that we have three of them in, in the little phase diagram that I showed earlier? Okay. And uh, well, we understand that the Cillin mode processes and that's the physical picture of what is happening to magnetization. And we understand where that comes from. What do these modes do? Do they also process? Uh, uh, what is the physical interpretation of um, the, the presence of this resonance? And uh, also, um, we know the, uh, the measurement of the Larmor frequency actually is very helpful in determining G factors and many other material characterizations, also measuring Faraday rotations, et cetera, et cetera. Are these chiral spin modes that I talked about useful at all? So these are the things that uh, we'll take a look at next. And um, actually, if you if you guys have any questions, please feel free to interrupt or pose them. Um, but otherwise, I'll just uh, go on. Okay. Um, so um, uh, let's uh, let's start with the first uh, question about why uh, are there three modes? So we'll take a step back again and look, look at why there was actually one mode in the case uh, of, of the, the Cillian collected mode that, that we looked at. And remember the picture there was, we applied the field, let's say in the X direction. 
and the magnetization was something that was processing in the YZ direction. And the analysis actually goes in the following way. It's purely based on symmetry, so it's elegant in that sense. Um, so the Hamiltonian, when we apply an in-plane field, um, just talking about the Zeeman field, not the orbital part of it at all. Um, so the presence of this term is such that uh, the X component of spin is conserved because it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, and we do recognize the time reversal symmetry is broken because of the presence of uh, this um, sigma x term in the, in, in the system. And the yz sim spin symmetry is preserved in the system because we are only uh, applying the field in the x direction. And what that does is that if you solve for magnetization in terms of the spin susceptibility tensor, uh, this f is, um, is to be seen as an external field. In this particular case, it will be the uh, magnetic field from the electromagnetic wave, not this field but the probing field that we apply. So just, let's just call it as F, it's not gonna be relevant. All the relevant information is in the structure. Now, because the X component of spin is conserved, uh, you cannot have fluctuations in the X component of spin. So this column, this row, and this column will be zero up front, just from symmetry argument, okay? And because time reversal symmetry is broken, it allows for the off diagonal terms. And when you couple it with this YZ uh, symmetry in the system, uh, what you end up um, finding out is that both these components are actually phase locked with the factor of I between them. Uh, the I comes in because you break time reversal symmetry. And because of this phase locking of phase of pi over two, you see the precession, uh, which is circular motion per perpendicular to the magnetic field, okay? So even though this sector is actually two cross two, and you would naively expect uh, two poles from this, you actually just get a single pole uh, corresponding to the cylind mode in, in, in the system. Okay, so that is why there's just one mode. So what happens with the chiral spin modes? Uh, why did we get three? The first thing to note is that this is the form of the Hamiltonian with the, the spin crossed into the, into the wave vector. The spin is no longer conserved. They don't, uh, it doesn't commute with the, uh, neither, comp neither of the three components uh, commute with the Hamiltonian, but time reversal symmetry is preserved. So the trouble caused by sigma is compensated by K here, the signs are taken care of there. And uh, for this special case, which is for Rashba, uh, there's a um, in-plane symmetry between X and, uh, well, basically uh, rotations in XY plane. That's a C infinity group, uh, this particular term. And what that uh, does to our uh, tensorial structure for spin susceptibility is that um, because nothing is conserved, none of these diagonal terms can be zero, they're all present. But because time reversal symmetry is preserved, uh, the diagonal terms now have to be absent and you're left with uh, these three components, which explains three modes that you get. However, let's not forget that for this particular Hamiltonian with Rashba spin orbit coupling, we have an in-plane C infinity V symmetry and that sort of, uh, you do get three modes, but the X and Y sectors are degenerate. So you get, uh, um, doubly degenerate modes and then one out of plane uh, Z mode in, in the system. So those are the three modes that we sort of um, saw in the little phase diagram that we saw. And then we can ask also, uh, well, okay, what happens if we add an external field to this? So our Hamiltonian gets this extra uh, magnetic field contribution. So spin still not conserved, but we break time reversal symmetry because there's no momentum here taking care of the little sign change that would have happened from spin. And X to Y symmetry, uh, the rotation symmetry in the XY plane is also broken because of this field, okay? So what that does is um, uh, essentially nothing changes from before, but because time reversal symmetry is broken, you do get these off diagonal terms that is present um, in the system, pretty much like what we saw in the cylinder mode case. So what happens here really is you still get three modes, but the Y and Z modes are, um, um, sort of coupled. And again, because this is due to breaking of time reversal, there's a phase locking of pi over two with a different amplitude and uh, the Y and Z modes start processing. And in fact, um, that is really what happens, which is at zero field, what we get are three linearly polarized modes. They're independent uh, and they have their own degree of freedom and uh, that is how they oscillate. As soon as you turn on the field, um, in this region, what you get is the X component consistent with the structure that we saw in the previous slide, the X component is uh, still linearly polarized, it's unaffected, but the Y and Z components uh, sort of develop elliptical polarization in, in the system. 
okay? And as we go past this critical field, there are some interesting properties that happen here, um, which I'm gonna skip for the sake of this presentation, but we can bring it up later. But as you go past this critical field where you have you can show that you cannot have three modes here. It's the regime where you can only have one modes. Um, I'm not, I cannot explain really why that number is protected, but it turns out to be so. And this particular mode is again, elliptically polarized. And as we go to the large field limit, the polarization is, excuse me, uh, sort of restored to the circular, which is the same as the ceiling legged mode. Okay. So, uh, uh, so this is basically what happens when these uh, resonances exist. They um, at zero field, they are just linear oscillations of magnetization independent of each other, but they sort of start processing when we apply a magnetic field. And which modes process kind of depends on in which direction you're applying uh, this, this magnetic field. Okay, so and uh, so this is about what is what is the physical picture of these modes, what they live and how many there are, et cetera, et cetera. How do you tune them with the field and everything else? There is one other interesting part of the puzzle, which I kind of um, uh, didn't really uh, go into detail uh, yet, but it's probably time to bring that up, which is when we were discussing this, um, the ceiling mode, we said that, well, yeah, the, the resonance seems to happen at uh, this unrenormalized frequency, um, G mu B, B, like everything is, uh, uh, sort of their their bare numbers. The G here is not really the G factor of the bare free electron, but it would be the, let's say the Lande factor that you would get for the particular band. That's how this is to be interpreted. It's not affected by electron-electron interactions. That's really the point here. Um, so this protection actually comes about from, um, uh, uh, so there's no real theorem, but it's an analog of Kahn's theorem. The Kahn's theorem was formulated for the orbital field where the um, BE over M, what is that called? The cyclotron frequency doesn't get renormalized by electron interactions because uh, the, term, um, the term that you add, the, the term that the magnetic field adds to the system commutes with the interaction term. So it cannot really affect any of those properties. And it's the exact analog of that here, except it applies to the X component of the spin. It commutes with the Hamiltonian, so it cannot really uh, play around with the, the magnitude of that frequency. Uh, that is really the statement why this is protected. For people uh, looking at field theory explanation, this is really, uh, you get a, um, a ward identity with vertex corrections and self energies that exactly cancels out because of a conservation law. The conservation law is uh, the fact that X component is spin is uh, conserved in, in this particular picture. And needless to say that uh, uh, when we go to the spin orbit coupled system, we saw that the spin is not conserved and hence you don't get any such protection. There is no analog of um, such protection that comes about and hence uh, the, uh, the frequency of these modes do depend on the strength of the electron electron interaction uh, that we get. This particular formula is for Rashba, which is why this X and Y sector is degenerate. Um, and it's also special to an S wave projection, which is why it is just a single parameter. If you have other angular harmonics present, you're gonna get more corrections to this one. Um, but uh, the fact that it is, um, um, it's actually induced by electron-electron interaction remains uh, in, in, in all of these cases. And uh, so these are about what these modes are, uh, kind of uh, where they are located and uh, how, how they're brought about by electron-electron interaction, et cetera. Uh, and the legitimate question here is, well, okay, what about the lifetime? Do these, um, do these modes actually survive uh, or are they just damped out by uh, uh, the presence of a continuum somewhere in the electronic system? And the answer is yes, they, they do survive. Um, so um, uh, it faces it, it uh, faces um, Fermi liquid like damping essentially. So uh, we can uh, look at look in detail. We can perturbatively look at what happens to the self energy, which captures um, sort of the finite lifetime of these modes, and the scattering rate that we extract is basically square of uh, um, square of the uh, frequency of the mode. Omega here would be the uh, frequency of the mode. And as long as you have large uh, Fermi surfaces in your system, um, uh, these modes are uh, well lived um, in your system. Okay. And uh, the thing to 
sort of um, acknowledge in in this damping is uh, is the fact that this is actually fundamentally new effect in the sense that this damping is present at t equal to zero. It is present in the absence of any impurities um, in the system. Um, so it's not uh, most of the damping that we talk about of let's say the, the ceiling mode or plasmons or any such thing like that, it's always at finite Q. So finite Q damping al also exists for these modes, of course, but this is a damping which, which is induced by interactions and uh, is already present at Q equal to zero for the uniform system at T equal to zero in the absence of impurities. The, the best analog of what this damping is, um, we didn't actually explicitly show this, but what we think is it's basically the microscopic version of the Gilbert damping that we um, encounter in spin systems. That is, when a spin moves in the background field of its magnetization, it gets damped, and this is basically a similar analog here. Um, this becomes evident when one goes to the self-energy calculation where this actually comes from, but that's, that's really um, what it is. So, um, now that we have seen, okay, the, these modes are well lived, uh, we understand what the physical interpretation is, um, uh, what the physical picture, or, um, what the polarization, etc., are. Uh, we can now ask, well, okay, is it just of academic interest that these modes exist, or can we use them for something interesting? And to do that, um, it's actually going to be relevant to look at the propagation of these modes. Uh, so we look at the finite Q behavior of all of uh, the features that we found here, okay? And uh, what happens is the following. So this is the same Hamiltonian that I showed you before. Um, and these will be the relevant energy scales corresponding to the spin orbit. Rush delta R is rush per delta D is Dresselhaus and delta Z would be from the external field that we're applying, okay? Now, the generic dispersion relation uh, turns out to be of this form. So there is a mass term, mass of the mode, um, and there's the usual Q squared term, which is usually associated with stiffness. And then there is this, um, what I would call as an anomalous velocity term. Now, this term is usually not present in any collective mode which has finite mass. And it, it, the argument is simply from analyticity that um, typically the relation of these spin propagators are omega square is omega naught square plus Q square. Um, that is the propagator form for these uh, bosonic excitations. And so you don't really get this unless something crazy due to interactions happen. Um, now, in this particular case, it's not so much due to interactions, but um, just the fact that uh, this is induced entirely by spin orbit. So you have a mass term and you have a velocity, uh, velocity term in, in, um, uh, in your dispersion relation. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, but the general dispersion relation here depends on, well, of course, the direction of propagation of the wave you're looking at, that is Q, and that angle is theta Q. And uh, it also depends on the angle at which you're applying the external field in plane, and that angle we'll call as theta B, okay? And these mass velocity and stiffness terms actually um, carry a lot of information um, from the system. So the mass term, which is, you know, in the absence of spin orbit, uh, with none of these terms over here, you would have just got the Larmor frequency, which was delta Z, and that's it. Um, there's nothing else uh, in the system. And typically the mass term in most collective modes is isotropic. Um, it's the same in every direction, except now we see that when we apply an external in-plane field, uh, there is an anisotropy with respect to that. And that anisotropy is only present when both components of uh, spin orbit coupling are present in the system. So, um, uh, uh, measure, measuring an anisotropy in the mass term indicates that you have both types of spin orbit coupling in the system. That's, I guess, statement number one. And the second thing is, well, if you, if you can also track the velocity of these modes, that is, you track the Q dispersion and look at what happens, um, the, the really nice thing is the Rashba term and the Dresselhaus term have different anisotropies. The Rashba term has a relative angle between the Q and B vectors, whereas the Dresselhaus term has an absolute angle, um, sum of the uh, two, two different vectors. So 
by tracking the queue dependence, you can filter out what comes, uh, what contributes, um, sorry, how much, uh, sorry, let me rephrase. Uh, you can extract what the Rashba spin orbit coupling is compared to the uh, Dressler spin orbit coupling, okay? Uh, this combined with this measurements will, will uh, tell you exactly what the um, respective uh, spin orbit coupling constants in that material are. So you get, uh, you can characterize these materials and get these numbers out. And in fact, um, we did precisely that. So we looked at the data for cadmium uh, telluride quantum well. Manganese is here just to enhance the spin response. It's not really doing anything else, but it's just the usual cadmium telluride quantum well. And this is the experimental setup where they, um, Q and B have an angle of 90 degrees between them, and then they rotate this in plane. And this is the resonant Raman response that they see. And they see it in the spin flip channel. So the response that they're seeing is a spin excitation. And they see a continuum of spin excitations. And below the continuum, they see um, a little uh, uh, resonance mode, pretty much along the same lines as the picture that I had shown before. And uh, they didn't... Uh, um, these guys actually had several publications trying to explain their data, and uh, we managed to do this with, uh, with our theory quite well, actually. Their dispersion was also of this form, um, and uh, in fact, the velocity was modulated with, um, uh, with the angle of the in-plane field that we go, and if we choose the, the geometry of the experiment, uh, we uh, precisely reproduce um, the, the pattern that we see here. But the only fitting parameter here is actually the many body interaction U that I was showing around, uh, which you can actually estimate also from the RS number for these semiconductors. But uh, uh, let's just use, let's just treat that as a, as a fitting parameter for now. But just using that as a fitting parameter, we can extract alpha and beta and these other numbers for the system. And they match up very well with their theoretical estimates that they, these guys were trying to put forward. Um, so I guess that's sort of a proof of concept. Even the mass anisotropy with the field also matches up very well. So this is a small oscillation around 0 0.4. Um, that is exactly what we get. The agreement is very good. I just don't have the data in term to show on one top of, of each other. Um, and this is about the dispersion, which is, um, uh, so this was the little term that I mentioned that at Q equal to zero, uh, when you disperse from here, you get this linear velocity dispersion term uh, in, in, in your system. And uh, th these were experimentally measured data points, and this is what we extract as well from uh, the results. Again, with just one fitting parameter, which is this dimensionless uh, U for the S-wave uh, projection of the interaction that we had mentioned. Um, so I realize I'm running out of time, and maybe I can uh, quickly go over the final few steps. Uh, so all of this were still done in the presence of finite field. Um, so it sort of um, is not honest to the um, title that I was advertising, which is about zero field resonances. And there are reasons why they couldn't go to zero field. It had to do with the manganese content that they had. But um, we did try one other material, which was this topological insulator bismuth selenide, which has surface states, which has a, basically a strong rush bar you can model the surface state as a strong Rashba chiral state in that sense. And um, so Girsch, Bloomberg, and Rutgers managed to get a sample where the chemical potential was in the gap for this uh, topological insulator. Um, and then um, what one could do is one could, um, this was actually a very good experiment in the sense that you do a resonant Raman scattering. Raman is typically a bulk probe, but what you can do is you can um, selectively couple to the surface state. So you resonate only from the surface states and carry and extract the um, sort of the, the spin chiral resonance that you get from the surface states out of that. So they look at the A2 channel of the Raman scattering spectrum, which captures any spin excitations in the system, um, or rather it captures the time reversal symmetry breaking excitations in the system. The system itself doesn't break time reversal symmetry. This is purely non-magnetic uh, ground state system. And uh, so this is the experimentally measured uh, scattering cross-section from uh, the experiment. And this is our model for uh, exactly the same, uh, uh, 
this A2 channel of, of the Raman response. And again, the only fitting parameter here is that dimensionless U quantity. And the fit was, to our, uh, to our surprise, fairly good. Uh, one can always question what is the justification for the U parameter in the surface states. We don't have an answer to that. So I don't claim complete explanation, but at least based on what we know so far, this seems to give the best agreement between um, to understand what this time reversal symmetry breaking excitation means in an otherwise non-magnetic system. And there are, of course, uh, other predictions we made for um, getting EDSR peaks in conductivity. The ESR signal gets modified due to spin orbit coupling. Uh, the Raman scattering cross section itself gets modified um, due to spin orbit coupling, et cetera, et cetera. We'll skip over that. And uh, there are uh, many other materials where similar things can actually be done. Uh, it's only a question of getting good lifetime in these materials. Uh, but I show this slide only to highlight the fact that there's a range of spin orbit coupled systems from 10 MeV angstrom. It has units of velocity. I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, and to a tunable cold atom systems to 30 MeV to even 4 EV angstrom in um, bismuth tellurium iodide systems like that. In many of these systems, you can actually tune the Rashba component by gating. That's another advantage in, in these quantities. And I just want to finish up with um, the uh, system which we uh, very recently started looking at, which is what happens when you sort of deposit graphene on transition metal dichalcogenide. Now, why did we choose this? Because um, Transition metal dichalcogenides have, um, have their own spin orbit coupling, which uh, the graphene layer experiences um, due to proximity. And that introduces um, some uh, uh, various flavors of spin orbit coupling. So of course, there's an intrinsic one that is present in the graphene lattice. It's really tiny. Uh, so I think there's only one experiment I've seen in terms of uh, uh, measuring a quantum hall um, related effect that could probe the scale somehow, but otherwise it's very hard to detect the presence of this one. Um, and currently in, in this community, there's a debate about which type of spin orbit coupling, Rashba or something called a valley Zeeman or Ising-like dominates. What the valley Zeeman spin orbit coupling is, is that it changes chirality between, let's say, K and K prime points. I don't have the K prime plot here, but that is really what Z Valley Zeeman is. It is. It acts like a constant magnetic field, but it reverses direction at K and K prime points. The rush button is more conventional. It introduces chiral uh, circulating states at K and K prime points. And uh, there are conflicting groups. For example, Morpurgo's group here claims what they see is a rush like splitting, whereas many theoretical computation actually support um, the fact that uh, from ab initio methods, uh, it seems like value Zeeman should be dominant. So what we decided to do was, well, okay, can we take a look at this and say, um, can, uh, can, can identifying proper resonances uh, tell us anything about the type of spin orbit coupling present in the system? And these are systems where, as all of you know, it's uh, not just spin. There's a spin, sublattice, and sort of a valley degree of freedom that are all intertwined, which makes this system actually quite interesting. And this is just a flavor of what is interesting in these systems. Um, so you, we get a novel EDSR effect. Uh, it's not like the one we saw in Rush, pure Rashba in two deg systems. Um, and so the novelty of this effect is that this only happens in the presence of valence bands. If you don't have that, you don't get um, that EDSR effect. And in graphene, of course, there's that lower Dirac cone, which supports this EDSR effect. And the effect is that in conductivity, you get this EDSR pole at the energy where you have uh, uh, the Rashba spin orbit coupling lambda r present. Uh, but you don't get that EDSR pole if it were to be valley zima. So, um, and we're working on this to sort of build a hybrid between two so that you can extract really what is the Rashba component, what the valley Zeeman component is. Okay, so that is one neat measurement. And these survive in the presence of electron-electron interactions as well, of course. I'm just uh, showing these cartoons for now. And also there is actually certain selection rules which are, uh, which appear in, in spin susceptibility. Now, typically we think of spin excitations you know, whether you probe in plane or out of plane, um, the, the spin excitation boundaries are the same in um, 
every component of spin susceptibility that we measure. And it is true in, in the case of 2DEG, all this chi XX, XY, YZ, ZZ, et cetera, they all have the same boundaries for the onset of the spin excitation continuum. But here, what we see is that the in-plane and out-of-plane degrees of freedom, uh, uh, there's um, certain excitations are captured only in the in-plane uh, probe uh, and some other excitations are captured in the out-of-plane probe. So these are um, at, uh, these are basically shifted from twice the chemical potential by an amount of spin orbit, and this is exactly at twice the chemical potential, uh, for instance. And uh, for the valley Zeeman case, it's actually not even sensitive to inter uh, spin excitations at all. There's just a single resonance. Um, so these are some interesting features that comes about. And the explanation for these things, because I'm running out of time, is it's best understood by not viewing them as spins, but really just extra quantum degrees of freedom and how they sort of, uh, how they transform under various uh, symmetries of the, of the Hamilton. Uh, basically going back to the very basics of theoretical physics, you don't label things, you just see how they transform uh, under various symmetries of the Hamilton. So with that, I guess uh, I should uh, conclude. And I think, um, instead of summarizing in words, I'll just leave it in pictures where um, I think what I tried to do here was expand the usual notion of spin waves that we have, which is, you know, a fixed ground state magnet with polarized spins. Then you hit the system, you get these little processing spin waves around it to this particular phase diagram in itinerant systems uh, where the features are much more rich. And then we talked about various effects that can happen as a result of uh, these new resonances that you get uh, in the system. And I'll just close by mentioning that um, where, I, where I think these will be interesting to probe at is, okay, we don't do magnonics, I just put it up there, but um, I think the fact that we get um, uh, this uh, elliptical polarization of these modes uh, in systems affects G factor measurements. Um, so sometimes uh, in, in, in 2D systems, when we try to measure G factors, especially if they have spin orbits, very likely that 2D systems have spin orbit coupling in general. But the anisotropy that people measure could actually be just be coming from the spin orbit and nothing, uh, not any inherent anisotropy in the system. And also perhaps uh, people are designing more and more 2D systems using photonic systems. Uh, perhaps some of these ideas can be extended there as well and see what is going on. Um, and in general, I think what I'm curious about is exploring what these new quantum degrees of freedom with, in graphene, we saw it as um, this valley and uh, sublattice degree of freedom. How do these interplay and uh, what electron and electron interactions can do? And uh, can we say anything new about such systems? So I think with this, I will pause and take questions if you guys have any. Okay, thank you very much, Saurabh, for this uh, very interesting talk. So we have some time for questions. And either unmute yourself or, or write a question in the chat if you want. So maybe I'll start with the question. So uh, in your two deg a problem with the, the Raspa and the Dressel House memory couplings. So we know that if, if they're uh, of equal strength, there's this emergent uh, SU2 pseudo spin symmetry. And then this gives rise to some interesting phenomena like this persistent spin helix. Persistent spin helix, yes. Yeah. So I was wondering whether in that case, what happens to your collective modes? Do they all, do they all become degenerate or do they disappear or uh, what happens in that case? Um, yeah, so um, actually I didn't include it here. I remember looking into that one. So we tried to include the Dresselhaus spin orbit coupling. Um, okay, the plots you had, uh, the diagram you showed that was for just pure Rashba? That was for pure Rashba, yeah. Oh, and then when you include Dresselhaus, uh, nothing really changes except the, you don't, uh, um, the degeneracy part sort of just uh, doesn't hold anymore because the, the Dresselhaus component breaks the in-plane symmetry, so the, the modes are already split out. Uh, but when uh, when we when we get 
um, the thing that happens is this continuum here collapses when. Uh, oh, I see. It goes all the way down to zero. Right. So you don't get any uh, uh, collective modes in that little sector over there. I see. Yeah, because I guess now you have a continuous symmetry. So then there's no there's no gap here. Right. So so you don't get excitations there, but in finite field you sort of get the three. Um, you get. Uh, well, this is not the field picture, but you sort of. Uh, uh, get the processing version of the Zeeman mode again. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, I guess the answer to your question is that it does collapse in, in that. Okay, area. I see. So in your plot, the delta D, I see. So when it's equal to one, this is when you hit the zero in this in this figure. Is that correct? Oh, uh, correct. Yes. Uh, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right over here. Yeah. It goes all the way to zero. I see. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get any instability per se, but I, I think. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's the emergent SU2 that you get in those systems. That, that is correct, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, Frank has a question. Yeah, hi, very nice talk. Um, Thank you. I'm just, Dressel House often comes in with cubic coupling to, to, the, to the momentum. Correct. And does that change, uh, how does that change things, if, if at all? Um, okay, great question. Uh, it, it, uh, yes, it comes with cubic coupling, uh, which is why I said if uh, the, the way you get the linear form is just by projecting it out. You can consider the cubic corrections to um, what we did here. Um, we didn't actually explicitly calculate this, but for, um, the, for the materials that we kind of look at over here, the chemical potential, the number density is such that uh, the wave vector does not quite, um, the KF that we get isn't large enough that the, the cubic terms will provide any significant corrections beyond the linear coupling that we already have. Um, so the answer to your question is we don't know, but in the materials we are trying to look at, um, those numbers, those corrections from the cubic terms are small. Thank you. But it's, yeah, it's purely just a game of the number densities in these systems, which tend to be low, yeah. Other questions? So I have one more question. So the, uh, in, in the topological insulator experiment, um, so you could extract the U, right? I guess by seeing how much you peel off the bound state from the continuum. Um, mm -hmm. So what's the value of U that you extracted? I'm curious, how strong are the interactions in the difference Oh, the dimensionless number that we extracted was uh, 0 0.6, I believe. Oh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.4, I have to just go back to this paper and check. And uh, the way we told ourselves it makes sense, uh, it's a very hand wavy and actually not the right way to do it as well. We just looked at, I guess, the screening in bismuth selenide and just uh, tried to get a ballpark of what RS would be and um, sort of just made an S wave projection from there and just looked at like, okay, the 0.6 or 0.5, something like of that order of magnitude is not terribly bad. But what, I mean, this was a bulk estimate. So really I have no grounds to use that number for the surface state resonance that we saw. So um, in, in that sense, I think this problem is still open as to really how to correctly model this one. But just in terms of getting an interaction correction to the resonance, well, that was the only thing we could capture. It captured the temperature dependence also quite well. So that was the only um, appeal to actually say that, okay, this something seems to be working. Okay, so, but, so you're saying the, the 0.6, so should I think of this as more or less like U times rho V? Density of states, yeah. Density of states I'm interacting. So that, that's, uh, that's reasonably strong. That's like U of the order of the bandwidth. Yeah, that's pretty fun, right? I guess. Yeah, I mean, if, if you argue that it is coming purely from uh, like these electrons here on the surface, uh, of course, you're never going to get that U um, uh, in the system. Uh, so the, I completely accept that criticism and I have no answer. As we said, we were just, we had a model which we tried to fit here. Okay, so your yeah, because your model is purely 2D, obviously. So you, you do the purely 2D direct only. Right, right, right. Uh, 
I think the correct approach there would be to actually calculate these interaction matrix elements projected onto the surface state for which you would need to know the surface state wave functions. So you have to sort of uh, collaborate with first principles people to get all that information, which we kind of went around here. Yeah. Okay. But the U that we used for the semiconductors was actually fairly comparable to uh, what you would expect in cadmium telluride quantum wells. Um, but then again, that was done in finite fields. So. And then what were the values uh, in that case for the cadmium telluride? Uh, for that case, it was, uh, uh, it's in our paper, but I think it was like 0 0.4. And that number checked out by doing just uh, if you try to take Coulomb interaction and screen it out with the Thomas Fermi and other things and look at the S-wave projection, it checks out to that number. Yeah, I get a pretty low density systems, right? So I get the, the interaction effects are fairly, fairly strong. Is that, is that Yeah, correct? yeah, yeah. Okay, any further questions? Okay, so Bob says, uh, thank you. And uh, there's no further questions. So uh, maybe we can just, thanks Rob again. Thank you for having me. Thanks everybody. Thanks Sir Rob. I, I, um, I'll stay on for a bit, um, Joseph, but that's okay. You can make me host if you wanna go. Sounds good. I will just close the recording uh, session. <laughs>